Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another event hosted by Terme. It's my pleasure to introduce our tonight's speaker, Professor Catherine Babayan. Professor Babayan is Associate Professor of Iranian History and Culture in the Department of History and Near Eastern Studies at the University of Michigan. She is also Director of Armenian Studies Program. Dr. Babayan specializes in the cultural and social histories of early modern Iran. She is the author and co-author of several books, including Islamic Sexualities, Slaves of the Shah, and Mystics, Monarchs, and Messias. Tonight, she will talk about the Iranian past or the Iran's past and present. Why, why does history matter? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Babaya. Thank you, Mariam. Thank you, Pariso and um, Hedia as well, um, for inviting me and uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak to you a little bit about Iran's history. When Parisa and Mariam actually first invited me, we kind of bantered together, deciding on what topic I would uh, discuss. And um, since Terme is actually a uh, society that works on contemporary Iran, I think there was a desire for me to talk about contemporary Iran, but I decided to talk about history with the present in mind, not only because I am a historian, um, but because I think as Iranians, we have a tendency not to take history so seriously. Uh, we focus on our poetry, um, and as though poetry is produced outside of a historical context. Um, and I think today in America, history is very much under attack as national monuments are being destroyed and um, the humanities and funding for the humanities and valorizing, well, um, fake news over um, history and the social sciences and the humanities are rampant. So I will then begin to talk to you today um, about a present moment in time, uh, showing you a couple of images from uh, one from shortly after the 1979 revolution, uh, where you have clearly a relationship here in the mural and the, the staging even of the photograph of you know the great Satan the Statue of Liberty um, and imperialism and the relationship between Iran and the United States and then a veiled woman holding the flag of the Islamic Republic of uh, Iran. And here another maybe staged uh, photograph as well um, during the 2009 civil rights movements, uh, what is also known as the Green, Green Movement where clearly you have men cross-dressing um, and uh, in the streets uh, rebelling. So I want us to think a little bit about um, these images. Um, I am a historian of gender and sexuality and so I want to try to give you a sense when we're looking at these images and going back in time about why history matters, um, but also how differently does history look when history is analyzed through the lens of gender um, and sexuality, right? Um, I think that we oftentimes also prioritize other kinds of history, political history, um, but both Pariso and, and Maria have been nice to take my class, but there you really see this relationship that's already created here between politics, um, imperialism, and the way in which um, the, the veil has uh, been staged here, along with so gender and the veil. 
and to think about what it is that when we focus on the veil, um, what is it that we're missing in this long history, both to understand how we've gotten here, but to also think about how different the past has been. And here we're dealing with sexuality um, and with cross-dressing itself, which a lot of you are familiar with the surgeries that are subsidized by the government itself, that are, is understood in the Western press as being this kind of um, uh, contradictory under the Islamic Republic of Iran, why is it that they are, that the government itself is subsidizing sex change operations, right? So here's an image, and I think it's a very powerful photo by this journalist uh, photographer who was in Iran in 1979 during the revolution, David Burnett. And it gives you such a sense of, first of all, the variety of people on the streets, right? Men and women of different ages, of different um, highest proclivities, um, veiled, unveiled, mustached, and bearded, right? So that the way in which we dress and the kind of hair, uh, and the semiotics of hair, is a very critical way, cultural marker um, that we're going to be thinking about, right? So it emits all of this variety of people, really the first mass revolution in the Middle East that should be understood alongside the Arab Spring. Um, we had a cross-section um, of women and men literally holding hands and um, going out and rebuilding in the street. But what happens uh, with uh, the Constitution and uh, with the, the Islamic Republican Party's um, taking of this mass revolt was to create citizens that were differentiated along the lines of particular kinds of genders, um, in that women were forced to wear the veil and men, oftentimes, who went out without a necktie as a sign, and with a beard, as a sign of resistance against imperialism and westernization, could have a choice of how they would want to uh, wear their facial hair. So let's think a little bit about, hold on to this image, and think about what focusing on gender and the veil obscures from a past. What kinds of erasures um, uh, occur uh, when we look back into history? And I will take you to a journey. Um, I hope it will be an interesting one. Um, back nearly 400 years and back nearly 200 years to the 1650s um, in Safavi, uh, Esfahan, and here to uh, Tehran, uh, a, a photograph by Anton um, Sevrugin, an Armenian uh, Russian who did a lot of photography at court of Nasreddin Shah, but also uh, photographing the streets of um, Tehran as well. Here, I always use this to, uh, to get my students uh, all riled up. Uh, who are they? Um, and oftentimes, they will never guess because of this mustache. Um, and this is a mother with her daughter. And in the 1890s, uh, the notions of beauty were such that beauty of a young female, um, and here you see uh, a man and a woman together, features of beauty were ungendered. And once um, a woman entered into maturity and adulthood, she didn't depilate. Um, that was also considered to be a sign and signifier of, um, of beauty. And so, what do you do with a society um, that, how do you understand a society where beauty was not differentiated according to gender? 
And how do we understand um, these conceptions and ideals um, of beauty? Okay, so let me take you to one of the spaces where these ideals of desire um, and beauty are formulated in. The control and display um, of the emotions of love, esh, and its associated malady of melancholy, soda, expressed in the longing for God, the beloved, takes us into the ubiquitous realm of Sufism, which was so integral to the daily lives of Esfahan's residents. This was produced in Esfahan in around the 1650s. To be a Sufi meant that one had come under the spell of love. And love was the language expressed in verse and prose through which intimacy was configured. Even as the ultimate purpose was to direct the Sufi disciple towards God in fraternal communities and tariqats, this was to be achieved through human guidance. And so Sufism concerned itself with the disciplining of adab, or etiquette, as an entire set of behaviors meant to regulate the carnal body and align the self through the intermediation of the Sufi master with the celestial order. Ritual gazing, nazar, was a, a stage Sufi devotees had to master on their journey towards union with the divine. It was to provoke the simultaneous sensation of separation from and longing for the object of desire. Boy gazing depicted the practitioner, often an older bearded man, contemplating a beautiful youth, Amrad, who represented the divine on earth. And since myst the mystic was meant to practice seeing and loving God, not the beautiful male youth, he was forbidden from acting upon his carnal desire. In this composition, two drawings attributed to Reza Fossi and his signature on both uh, folios, the calligrapher mater and painter, materialized on paper this state of separation between the beautiful beloved and the Sufi gazer. These drawings were executed on two separate sheets of paper and then assembled, assembled side by side in a morata, in a photo album. A grid separates them and confines each to its original state of composition. The artistic production and um, the placement of these two images in dialogue with one another illustrates how rit ritual gazing was indeed a method of contemplation meant to help achieve the mystic lover's self-discipline and purification. As he gazes, he desires, and then delays the encounter. Desire was the emotional mechanism that made recognition and appreciation of true beauty possible. And here, on paper, we can see how desire is activated. A poem frames the dipstitch to guide the viewer's understanding of the image. Written by another calligrapher, who has a signature on the side too, Nuruddin Muhammad al Lohiji, whose signature appears on the left margin of a third sheet of paper, the hem stitch reads, Khat is sabzat ke o yehubist. Your green line, khat, that is a beautiful sign. The word khat here refers to the first sign of facial hair above the beloved's lip. This line is commonly referred to as green because of how black hair is perceived as it is grown on olive skin. But khat means more than just a line of hair or of poetry. It also means an inscription and, and a script. Um, a resident uh, uh, living in uh, Esfahan at the time uh, would read this hemistitch uh, quoted here and would associate it with a young beloved, an object of desire. The collating of these two images expands on the meaning of khat. This is an iconic image of Sufi gazing. 
to absorb the ritual context of gazing, the images together with the line of poetry explain the rules of its practice. The green line of the beloved is both a liminal symbol of masculinity and a male fetish. But when located within Sufism, celibacy and boy gazing signified the sacred. To fulfill the role of an ideal lover, a friend on the mystic path had to refrain from acting on his desire, and he had to remain celibate. Yet the very processes of disciplining the gaze, I argue, produce desire. You see here from the same period, this is a, a miniature from Moina Musabar that very clearly shows you the triangulation of desire between Again, um, ideal beauty of three figures. You can only guess which is the female because of the locks, and sometimes locks doesn't even um, designate who the female is. But her hat gives us a sign, the fact that she is held and embraced by the male. But there is this traffic, this movement of seeing and, and desiring between the sari, the cupbearer, um, and um, the lover and the beloved itself. This is a typical triangulation that really shows you the possibilities of desire for at least the man towards both a male youth and a female at the time. Just to give you a sense for those who don't know where Esfahan is, um, this is more or less um, the map of uh, Safavi Iran. These are places, the Kurdish region of contest, uh, contestation, as well as Armenia, still um, that is the case. And then play, uh, the area beyond the, the, uh, the Oxus River, uh, where there was war between the Uzbeks and the Safavis, and here this region of Kandahar, uh, between the Mughal Empire and the um, Safavi realm. Esfahan. Let's go to Esfahan. The bazaar um, and the mosque, the two lungs of a Muslim city, were separated in Esfahan. So you have the Masjid al Shah and the Qaysariye. Um, were separated in Esfahan by a vast open space bounded by an arcade with 200 storefronts. Developed in 1592 and designated as the image of the world, the Naqshe Jahan, was designed to orient the medieval city along a new axis. And the medieval city was more in the north. It's a Seljuk um, and a Mongol um, city. And would become the site of a revolution in the function of urban space. Naqsh refers to design in both the figurative and verbal sense of engraving and intent, an image often associated with a sheet of paper. Authors in the 17th century Esfahan came to read the new central square as a surface of a page, a blank sheet of paper reading a range of possibilities into the composition. The double entendre in its name also cleverly links the paintings on the walls of its arcade. So we have to imagine the paintings have all been whitewashed. All of these white spaces in the arcades were all painted and usually depicting uh, paintings of heaven uh, and paradise, flowers, flowing rivers, uh, honey, beautiful male and female youth. The double entendre in its name also cleverly links the paintings on the wall of its archive to the Quranic verses, creating an analogy between this rectangular space and the sheet of paper. Images and words inscribe heavenly sights and rewards along the walls of the square to create paradise on earth. Fully exposed to the light of day, these elements made the image of the world, the Naqshe Jahan, manifest as an array of legible power symbols across the surface of the new square. Passing
starting by a commanding five-story royal building, so the Oli at the entry of the palace complex, a spectator would see the Golden Dome, right across, the Sheikh Rodfoda Mosque, of a private royal mosque which communicated the intimate relationship between politics and religion. At noon prayer, artisans, merchants, and shoppers walked from the bazaar across the 1,840 feet span of public space, where an urban economy of piety, pleasure, and po politics circulated under the gaze of the court and the mosque. To the south, um, they faced a magnificent tile port, uh, portal of the first Friday prayer congregational mosque, inscribed with the famous saying, the hadith from the prophet, I am the city of knowledge, and Ali is its gate. And Madina told Elm wa Ali Babu. Flanked by two minarets, this architectural masterpiece was built to proclaim Shiism as the religion of the Safavi Empire. Shah Abbas appointed a Shi'i scholar, Sheikh al-Bahai, chief religious dignitary, and Sheikh al-Islam. The Sheikh's role was to help bolster the Shah's legitimacy and devise a communal platform for the inclusion of Sunnis and Shi'i worship. Residents of Esfahan, who were mostly Sunni, were meant to participate in a fashioning of a singular religious community. Um, he popularized religion by writing his Jomil Abwasi, a manual of proper etiquette and, and religion. In this manual, he encouraged the majority of the Sunni population of Esfahan to enter a new communal space of worship that would, over the long durée, educate and convert them to Shiism. Together, the Shah and the Sheikh worked closely to cultivate and assemble a Muslim community of Sunni and Shi'i residents. The historical processes of conversion to Shi'ism that pushed Sufism, the original ideology of the Safavi revolution, to the outer limits of acceptability um, are complex. Here, I just want to say that Sufism was a popular mode of religiosity that competed with both the dynastic household as well as with the newly established Shi'i clerical community. Against the backdrop of rival assertions of intimacy to God, Shi'i jurists devo devoted much energy to curtailing mystical forms of sexual and spiritual practices. So here, the label of Sufism and boy-gazing, Shahid Boz, came to be associated with heresy, both in polemics and actually in public executions that were um, displayed in the Maidan -e Shah itself. So think of it as a similar moment in time where the sexuality of Sufis um, was condemned uh, by the government and the Shi establishment with the kind of moral police that we're going to lead to as far as policing um, the dresses and the headscarves of women. So under the guise of a moral campaign disseminated through conduct uh, manuals and ethical treatises, Shi scholars asserted their commanding role in the communities, at, at times to bolster the role of the monarch and at others to be directly in competition uh, with Sufis. Between 1640 and 1650, clerics in Esfahan penned more than 20 treatises condemning boy-gazing, celibacy, and Sufism, and came to privilege matrimony. So heterosexual marriage is not necessarily a modern phenomenon. We're already seeing in the 17th century, uh, an embracing of um, marriage over um, relationships, at least male relationships, with other men as well, at least by the Shi clerical community. The Sufi practice of gazing and celibacy came to signify excess, which stigmatized its practitioners as deviants in the community. An entire mystical way of life which had permeated guilds, Sufi tariqats, and coffee houses and elite households 
were condemned. We know, of course, and this is a um, more or less contemporaneous um, Austro-Hungarian traveler or the artist who depicts um, the the Maid on the Shaw, and you see very clearly that this is the Rey Saint Pierre. That this, it was a bustling place. There were tents here where there were dokans, there were shops that were um, set up. Here it seems like there's a mannequin, there's somebody in the middle who's actually giving a performance, um, storytelling surrounding him. So that the place was a very densely um, used public space. We know, of course, that what was banned um, not only acts to counter practice, but even further incites practice. Let's turn for a moment to Ghazal poetry, to think about this moment in time where Ghazal poetry comes down literally to earth, moves from a metaphysical, so that's another kind of shift that you see in this period of time, from a met metaphysical appreciation of the divine, like that ideal um, image I showed you of the Sufi gazing at the young male, to earth, to earthly figures, to earthly boy lovers, um, to places, to naming the, the coffee house, and naming actually the streets in which they are engaged um, in this kind of erotic um, behavior. Uh, Muhtasham of Kaushan um, is an example of this new Maktabe Vuhui or Vuhu um, that contemporaneous literary scholars have associated with this different kind of writing of, uh, of Ghazals. He's a poet who has the dubious distinction of being what disc jockeys would call a one hit wonder. He composed a eulogy on Imam Ali. For which, uh, sorry, Imam Hussein, for which he received much fame and would be remembered until the present day. The fame of this one poem has overshadowed, however, a rich, diverse body of work that fills two volumes of his divan that has recently been published in Iran. Koshani's Resoleye Jaloye is a good example of how the Ghazal was reappraised in this period taking a new direction, a new school of poetry, referred by the Maktab of Uli. Turning away from sim Sufi symbology, this realist school looked back to the amatory origins of the Ghazal, the encounter between refined but all too human lovers, their ploys and their delights. Mood swings, tantrums, evasions, elations were depicted really with a new directness and psychological insight. In 1562, when Koshani was 34 years old, the poet had a stormy and infamous affair with a young lover named Jalon. During the course of this affair, he composed 64 ghazals, a number equaling the value of the letters in Jalon's name. In claiming to give a true account, the occurrence of the event in the relationship, the pro poet provides what is, in effect, a manifesto of the realist po poetics of the Maktab of Ugui. It's not a question of the gender of the beloved that is new. There is nothing inherently scandalous in the, resol, in the epistle, epistle's homoeroticism. And again, he's a she, very respectable Shi'i um, poet as well. And he writes both this epistle for Jalol and a um, uh, Ghazal for a courtesan, a female courtesan. For Kashani, there's nothing strange about it because, um, you know, according to Plato, um, this is really a form of romantic love that was practiced in Safavi, Iran. Rather, it is the question of the nature of love itself. Jalol embodies love as the play of passion, jealousy, and deceit. The epistle is the history of an obsession of a middle-aged poet, narrator's infatuation, and unredeemed disillusionment. Let me tell you about, a bit about this love story, which unfolds during Jalol's brief posting um, as a resident in his hometown of Kaushan. The poet explicitly states that Jalol is employed as a shotir, a footman, 
um, a handsome servant in the service of a noble house. Jalo's skill at dancing is the subject of two azars, but his talent is just one aspect of the physical grace and attractiveness um, that were prerequisites for the job of a shote. The opening sections of the love story tell how the poet was first smitten by Jalo and made his initial declarations of love. And then a spiraling cycle of jealousy and suspicion and breakups and reconciliation follows, all set against the backdrop of a seemingly endless succession of parties, of banquets, and of public celebrations. Along the way, a series of rivals are introduced, as Jalol and Koshani each resort to, to outside affairs to manipulate the passion of the other. And the final reconciliation the cycle is broken when Jalol is transferred to Esfahan, and the two part with a bittersweet exhaustion. Each step of the story is marked with a ghazal, using the full gamut um, of the rhetorical qaraz, right, or purposes of the genre, praise, devotion, complaint, reproach, threat, apology, description, and self-analysis. Besides tracing the actualities and extremes of amorous passion, the epistle of Jalol shows how poetry actually served as the form of social interaction, of courtship and entertainment among a leisurely urban class. And so that's another way in which many of us are beginning to do history, um, to actually use poetry, and especially when it's referring to real circumstances, as a way to enter into how people thought, how people practiced, um, and what meaning that they gave themselves to their lives. So part of a social and, and uh, cultural history. Caught in the throes of an obsessive passion, the poet narrator is subject to wild mood swings between tender devotion and blind rage. And no one section can do full justice to these emotional ranges that he takes us through. But to give you a taste of the, of the poem letter, let me read a translation of one extreme, a crisis point in the final cycle of their relationship. In the previous section, Koshani had sworn to break off the affair once and for all after witnessing Jalol caught in the act, declaring his love for yet another new admirer. Brooding for several days, the poet is drawn irresistibly to the city square, the Nakshe Jahan, where he knows that he will find Jalol performing his public duties at the Maidan for the Friday prayer procession and is drawn towards him. My translation um, is also drawn from Paul Lezinski's translation with some um, variants. Alas, a thousand times alas, that this base nature carts his most sheltered roses off to the market like a grubby florist, and lets them be handled by the city's populace. Woe, woe upon mirrored woe, that the appetite of this peasant character take most of his delicate fruits from under the orchard's boughs, send them to shopkeepers, and expose their natural delicacy to the onslaught of flies. Let it not be concealed, although it should be, that for a few days after I had stormed from the home wrecker's home, feeling such aversion, I neither went anywhere near his house, despite the anxiety that I felt over what had transpired in that nerve-wracking encounter, nor did I allow any of his associates to pay a visit on my modest dwelling. However, on Friday, when the expanse of the public square became the stage for the palm tree of the meadow of enlightenment to display himself, and as was required by a footman's professional duties at the inauspicious time to cheapen the precious dates of his presence in public. I dragged myself on up to the corner of a rooftop, where I am right now taking this picture, um, enjoying the isolation in which to endure my despair. Secretly, I watched the procession of that cheap fruit peddler and his encounters with everyone crowded, crowding the square, all for a few debased pennies. But what should I say? 
how to traverse, traverse the path of even describing the way he walked by, which would lead in the end to the valley of dissolution. And then he moves from prose to poetry, which is also an interesting mixture of, um, of genre. Without warning, he said, words led me to a place that brings disaster down on my power of speech. The populace has recognized the city beggar as my king. My disgraceful gaze has blackened my reputation in this town. Friend, smash my head against the stone, so I won't bow in adoration at a threshold worn smooth by common feet. The sangyam sarbekub e hamneshin to osetan e u ke as peye kesan ke as poye kesan farsu de nabvad sajdegah man. If only my glance had never fallen on the face as shiny as a mirror that everyone constantly cleans with his foul breath. That's pretty serious. In a moment of rage. Muhtasham divulges his resentment that brings out the worst of accusations against Jalal. In recorded speech, he discloses his love for Jalal, a secret that Adam requires him to conceal. So there's even in this process of desiring and courtship and actualizing love for a young uh, footman like Jalal, there is an etiquette and adapt to it too. And to divulge it like this openly, that's um, crossing the line. Cast as a fruit peddler, he calls Jalol a peasant who sells himself like fruits and flowers, allowing his clients to touch his goods indiscriminately. Mohtasham's vanity is mixed with shame. He cannot control his passion for Jalol, who has shared himself with other men, just as he has with Mohtasham. What blackens Mohtasham's face, right, so an idiom in Persian as far as embarrassment and humiliation is concerned, is his obsessive love revealed. Now each and every one in Esfahan recognized that he, Mohtasham, had become sub subservient to Jalal. Like a king who had, has turned into a beggar, Mohtasham's public passion has inverted the social order of things. It is the reversal of roles that upsets the asymmetries of power between adult males and beloved youths, the Amrad, which has caused Mohtasham his reputation. In the public square of the Maidan, where love is recognized and judged, uh, Mohtasham is self-conscious even as he watches Jalol uh, from a secluded space on the second floor of the arcade, enclosing the Maidan. If only my glance had never fallen on the face as shiny as a mirror that everyone constantly cleans with their foul breath. The initial glance or gaze that ignited Mohtasham's love for Jalol has the potential to disrupt the prescribed social order of men whose loyalty and solidarity must be maintained through the protocols of symmetries between friends and asymmetries between lovers and their beloveds. Society holds Mohtasham accountable for having lost himself to Jalal. At least that is the perception that the poet relates. His choice to reveal his shame in the Maidan, even as he's perched in um, a secluded place, exposes his ambivalence, his arrogance, is fused with indignation and with humiliation. So here we really enter into this complexities of love and desire and these differentiations of age and status that I am arguing become flattened or forgotten in the modern period. There are other um, forms very clearly um, in this period of time of male um, relationships. Um, male friendships, Sire uh, Barodat Khondegi, that really, according to Sadeh Hedayat, actually comes all the way to the modern period when he does his ethnographic work. Um, in uh, the 
20th century, a, a handshake and an exchange of, um, of poetry, of Hazal, probably poetry. Um, these are affinities of love, right, that could go to erotic and could also playfully remain within the domain of ish itself. And one of the things that I'm arguing is that in the modern period, friendship, yori, but mostly dusti, actually comes between men um, to separate these affective, these emotional ties um, that were very much acceptable in this period of time. As far as women are concerned, we have less information, unfortunately, uh, about women, but uh, we do have some, um, and I'm, I'm hoping that my students uh, will find more. Here is a miniature by um, a very interesting painter in Esfahan. Uh, what you actually see in this period of time is a lot of the painters don't only work for court and for the elite ateliers, they actually work for merchants and artisans, so we get a whole range of sort of everyday um, depictions. And he, Muhammad Wasim, I think had uh, female patrons, um, so he, he depicts a lot of women. And here, if we don't know the cultural context, and if we don't read the poetry, what we can say from the symbolism, um, and here's Muhammad Wasim's signature, which is again a new thing in this period, but, uh, painters sign of the works that they're doing. Um, we have, you know, the bottle of wine, right? The jug of wine, uh, the wine cup. We have a woman who looks, you know, smoking a hookah, looks kind of disheveled. Um, but here, what's interesting is that sometimes in these miniatures, you would either see an image of a male um, lover, and sometimes you would see a female. And in this case, it's clearly a female. Um, we know from, again, some uh, satirical work, um, in particular by Ogajamwane um, Khansari, who makes fun, basically, Makre Zanon, makes fun of a lot of women's practices, that they were practices of Khohar Khandegi as well. They were Siemes. It was legal. You actually have certificates um, that are authorized by the Ghazi, both for um, male friendships and female friendships. And one of the exchanges between two females who accept to be each other's friends are the necklace. She has a necklace you don't see it very well, um, but um, so does the main uh, distraught woman. I'm going to read a little bit of the frame for you. It's not clear whether the frame is from the same period. It could be that the frame was added later, but even the way in which the poetry is chosen for a frame that's added later tells you about the meaning of the miniature itself. And I'm going to read a little bit of it. The memory of your neck um, remains inscribed in, uh, with me. The rays of the sun cannot be stored. A hundred odes in praise of you, each written on the back and bottom of a hundred pages. Having written a book of poetry, read not to a soul, weave another world out of your temperament and its tab. Bedivan borde va bar kas nakhande bebaf az tab be khod dunya i digar. I took another path. Oh dear companion, though I failed in this effort, So the meaning of what is happening in this image and what it is commemorating as well um, is quite clear. And there are several examples that I don't want to uh, take a lot of time, but we can, in the Q&A, this is a, a miniature uh, from the same Muhammad Qasim, again, of uh, the story, the epic love story of uh, Suzo Godot's um, burning and melting, right, by uh, Noye Khabushani, who travels from Khabushan Khorasan to uh, India, and, and witnesses a sati, witnesses an Indian bride going into the fire when her husband dies. 
And this becomes part of the, the story that um, he writes about a moment in time, and that's interesting how Muhammad Abbasan interprets this moment in time, um, where it's the, wedding, it's the wedding night. Unfortunately, what happened at the wedding night, bad architects at the time, the house falls apart on the head of the, the groom, he dies, and so she eventually um, also um, enters in, into the sati, goes into the fire, right? So there's a beautiful image that he has too of her um, going into uh, fire and burning herself. Um, but what's interesting is that the way in which he interprets it, uh, Muhammad Hassan, is that part of this story is about, again, a friendship and a love between these two women as they're looking in the mirror, uh, like Muhtasham looks at Jalal in the mirror as a representation of beauty, and actually really sees, it seems here, her own reflection, which may also give a different interpretation that this is partially um, what led to the ill fate um, of this love affair. It's unclear, but definitely the painter is intervening into a very different, this, this uh, poem was written in 1604, this is 1656, a very different interpretation of this moment in time. Okay, I will take you quickly into the 19th century and re rely mainly on the work of my colleague, um, Afsan Hinajwabadi, who's done this fantastic book on reinterpreting the constitutional revolution through the lens, again, thinking how differently will that history look like if we bring in gender and sexuality as a mode of um, analysis. And here, too, you see the continuation of the same kind of ideals of beauty, not able to distinguish between male and female. Can you distinguish? Um, both have hana on their hands, so that's not even um, a way of distinguishing, except that you know, probably this may be a sign um, of being a female, but really identical um, beauty between the male and the female, except for maybe the, the gesture of the embrace. What happens um, that Najwa Wadi sort of looks at is that you stop having this public um, paintings of an amorous couple, of a male and a female, male, male sometimes, right? And there are many different reasons for it, um, one of which, which is important, that I think is one of those threads that I'm trying to develop for uh, the present period, is that under the scrutiny of the West, and this happens both in the Ottoman Empire, in the Arab provinces, and in um, the Iranian world, uh, one sign of backwardness when the Europeans look at the Islamic world is the veil, is seclusion of the female, and is amradwazi, is what they call um, you know, homosexuality by that time, a category that that didn't exist, right, in this pre-modern period in the Iranian world. So there's a beginning of a real consciousness, right, of not allowing this ambiguity to be um, painted and portrayed. So very obviously, in case you didn't know whether she was a female or male, breasts are incorporated into the body or onto the body of the female so that the viewer who takes it will take a long time for him or her to shift their aesthetics, right? Begins to decipher between a female and a male beloved. Even the logo of what we call Horshi Khanum, wasn't Horshi Khanum to begin with, right? Um, very early on it was this ambiguous sign, logo of the Iranian imperial uh, court, uh, of the lion and the sun, very ambiguous as well. This is on, again, a public display uh, on the Shapsur Emore, one of the palaces of Nasser Din Shah in Tehran itself, and from the year, let's say, 1850, to the uh, original logo 
1871, so 21 years of, of separation, right? Already the male lion becomes much more masculinized, and the, the face of the, um, the sun is gradually disappearing. Those who know the sign of the Shida Horsheed of uh, uh, under the Pahlavis and today it becomes an abstract, total abstraction, so that any kind of facial features are erased from the sun and the lion itself. Very clearly, too, you have shifts in the way in which even uh, Iran is imagined, right? So here is a moment in time in 1907 where Iranians had a lot of hope for the constitutional revolution. Um, and uh, again, one of the influences from Europe, from the French Revolution, and a revolution that would happen in the Ottoman Empire as well, in Russia and in Japan. And here you have a Pahlavan, right, the kind of thug, um, who's holding a balance, and there's a lot of um, this, is the, this is the monarchy, and this is the parliament that was established, um, and it's, it is actually the male Pahlavan who is um, bal balancing the um, Iran and both, um, so Mizan, it's Taodol is referred to as a balance, the two branches of government, Qanun, um, Sharia, uh, Orf, um, and Hukuk are mentioned too, and Hubul Vatan, um, and definitely a, re a reference to the brotherhood, the male brotherhood. So friendship is being translated, male friendships, into a citizenry um, that is connected together around love for Latin. Um, and in that process, then Iran has to be turned into a mother figure um, in order, again, to create a very heterosexual um, and opposite sex desire and, and relationship so that here you have a moment in time again here you have your brotherhood um, of, uh, of compatriots, right? Kumbul um, Vatan here, and uh, the female figure, and there's a reference to Maudad, right? And to, to protecting the mother here, uh, being ravaged by, in the north, the Russians, um, and in the south here, the British, the two kind of imperialist power that are taking or threatening the independence, uh, um, yeah, the independence of, of, of Iran. So just imagine how the public space is being shifted, right? That now in this public space, um, in the streets, here you have one male woman. Um, it's, a, it's an early uh, photograph of te downtown Tehran, um, I think 1915, maybe. The public streets no longer are male dominated. It's not only the streets of the men, there are women who are also entering into the space. Um, and to just give you a little gist of what it means to go out in the public uh, uh, streets, this is Tambi, is a satirical um, magazine, uh, newspaper, uh, that here um, really clearly uh, refers to, um, I will talk to you about it, a moment in time, so I think it's 19, so it's, it's post-1911, so it means it's after the failure of the Constitutional Revolution itself and the political um, disillusionment of the, the Constitutional Revolution, where the figure of the Farangi Mwab, the one who looks like a Farangi, who pretends to be um, uh, a Farangi, again, it has all to do with clothes, comes to be associated, right, with the political opportunism um, as unprincipled people who change color every day. To get ahead in the newly emerging modern state bureaucracy, all one had to do was to shave one's face and to dress like a fat animal. Cartoons in Tambi clearly portray here an ignorant charlatan who had previously lived by dressing as a mullah, um, now transforming himself 
into somebody who looks westernized. More explicitly, can these satires chastise modernists as Christian boys who, who have stolen people's hearts and their cross-shaped hair? A tifle tajaddu talab, a bache tarso, voy bur de de lechal bedon zul fechalipo. Who had come out really of this new schooling system, a new Western, westernizing school system, knowing very little. But they knew how to wear a necktie, and they knew how to pin a flower on their collar. They're constitutionalists, supposedly, and they desire modernity. Who wants to institute European laws, I'm quoting from one of the Tanvi's satires, and who think that they can solve the country's dire problems by adopting European fashion? The emerging split between the parliament and the modern state's bureaucracy under Rajar Iran and the hard-working urban population was understood as a cultural war between the effeminized ambiguity of the Foucauli, the one who looks like the, the Westerner, and the old-style masculinity of the Pahlavan that we saw um, holding the balance. Once homoeroticism and same-sex practices became marked as a sign of Iran's backwardness, heteronormalization um, of eros and sex became a condition to achieve modernity, a project that called for men and women to socialize in public space and a reconfiguration of the Iranian family itself. This process was by no means identical for men and women. Male homoerotic affective bonds were reimagined as asexual sentiments among citizen bro brothers, and male friendships were transformed into patriotic national camaraderie. Men's same-sex liaisons and sexual practices were blamed on ignorant wives. The promotion of women's education, I think, must be understood in this light. Um, of course, men didn't want to socialize, right, with ignorant women. They preferred to escape their wives and spend their time outside of the home, went the story, engaged in Ahmad Bozi. So again, it's really the fault of the woman um, for this desire. And I will end because I want to have some Q&A. Um, our post-1979 concentration on the veil, this is again Sevrugin, um, who you saw, the mother and daughter. It's not, a, it's not a 20th century, it's the turn of the century, 1890s. The veil was a fascination for uh, the Westerners and Orientalists, but it is still for us as well. Um, so this concentration on the veil and on a critique of cultural construction of gender for the formation of Iranian modernity has erased so much of Iranian history. Here you have the the Geshta Zahra, the morality police, um, making sure, right, that um, women have their their headscarf properly um, on on their heads. Women have certainly paid for this price, but by focusing on gender, on veiled women, we remember women and forget the male beloved, the Amrad, and to forget a very different history, different sexualities different desires of love and friendship. But this is how history works. It never, there's always a silent and, and a undercurrent that will emerge to fight these kinds of attempts at erasure. Today, the haunting figure of the Amrad now threatens to come back in the form of trans-dressed young men um, in urban Iran. Female teenagers have discovered that transdressing, shaving their hair, helps them cope with the difficulties of everyday life as young women in Iran and men have taken on the veil in solidarity with women. The alarm with which this phenomenon is reported in the Iranian press does not arise simply out of a concern for hazards these young women may face in the urban streets of Tehran. The trans-dressed young females 
and men bring back from our pre-modern memory, despite all our cultural efforts to forget it, the figure of the Amrad for men and the Amrad Nomal for women. Thank you. Thank you for the nice speech. Um, uh, I had a question about the ways of changes that you mentioned, especially in the contemporary uh, uh, history. How has the wave of urbanization coming from rural area and uh, urban settlement played a role in these waves, uh, both like at the time of Pahlavi and later on after 1979? Thank you. Um, thank you. So I'm not a specialist on these waves of uh, urbanization, but what I'm talking about here is a larger cultural phenomenon. It's a way really to be modern. Um, and so I think that one has to think about the power of this kind of culture, whether it was the case under the Pahlavi uh, and, the, and the Qajars, the early Qajar period as well, right? These kinds of social and cultural um, sort of taboos and embracing, right? And I think probably, you know, um, it would even be more um, amongst the, the rural elites, right? I'm thinking of uh, Jalal Ola Ahmad's uh, really powerful stories that he writes um, during the Pahlavi regime where it's very clear that, you know, he talks about how there's a villager who has three wrist watches, all right? Um, or who, just has a desire to enter into the movie theater, right? So these are all these kinds of practices that made you feel um, like you were, you were a modern Iranian man or a modern Iranian woman. So, you know, there are closer studies that should be done on it, but my general response would be that I think that there's sort of, one is even more greener, more, um, I didn't mean green in a, in a naive sense, but that there's, there's an attempt even more to embrace the culture of the urban, um, in the case of the Pahlavis and the Qajar, that of westernization. And now it's a little bit more of a complicated situation, right? I mean, the last uh, January uprisings that we saw really came out of rural areas, right? And they were mostly youths who were born after the Iranian Revolution, right? So the kind of discontent there, um, and they didn't look westernizing, but of course now, you, what does it really mean? But the zeal in the black market of, you know, um, Michael Jackson or whatever the newest uh, movies and music are show you that there's definitely, you know, the cultural revolution uh, the only thing that is held onto as far as the ideals is the veil um, and is this rhetoric of anti-US imperialism. Everything else really has, I think, in, in many ways been lost. So I don't know, it's a roundabout way of answering your question, but I hope um, I answered some of it. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk, Professor Babayan. I just have one question about uh, the vocabulary that you notice in the 17th century mm -hmm. poems. So uh, you talked about the love between Muhtasham and Jalal, and also in your last slide, you saw this fascinating image of two female friends. So I was wondering in the context, context of 17th century, mm -hmm. how did the vocabulary defining male, male, and female, female, That's friendship differ or overlap mm -hmm. in the context of 17th century? Yar. Yar is what's mostly used, and yar could be masculine or feminine. Um, and I think that's where even sort of this one um, travelogue that I worked on, this hajjah by a woman who leaves from Esfahan and goes to see her, um, old uh, Yar um, in Urdubad, who had been forced to leave 
Eve because of rumors around their relationship. She refers to her husband as Yod. She refers to this companion as Yod. She refers to God as Yod, right? These are, and this is really coming out of sort of this mystic language um, of love and, des and, and desire, right? So what needs to be still studied is that when does Dust really come into this language um, and, and usage yeah, probably in to the late Pajor or maybe early Pahlavi uh, era where Dusti, I mean you'll never, when you say Yara Man today in Persian, you really mean your beloved, right? It's not, you won't tell your friends. Um, you may say, you know, uh, Ham Nishin or Ham Sohbat, um, but you won't, you won't use your, right? And so I think that that kind of shift of usage is still needs to be studied. What do they use for the Ottoman case or the, the later, the early Turkey? They use your. Okay. is definitely much more prominent. When you yourself are calling your friend, right? Sure. First of all, thank you so much for, for the very interesting talk. Um, so how do you think this historical discourse that you just explained to us could be included in today's movements, women's rights movements, especially in Iran. Um, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure you know all about this um, recent movements against this forced hijab. Mm -hmm. And how, how uh, like, um, I mean, women activists, they could use this discourse in their everyday endeavor. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So where does history and activism come together, right? I mean, I think, as a historian, just to be conscious and aware of this past, right? Also to be aware about really what we're doing when we're only focusing on gender and not sexuality, because the veil is about the female gender um, in particular, right? And so to bring in sort of an, an awareness also of sexuality and the way in which, let's say, these Amrad Numans, right? They're, they're enacting and they're performing actually um, sexual politics, right? So I think that that kind of consciousness, um, you know, I, I wouldn't go about prescribing anything, um, but I think that then, you know, what, if, what history does and how it turns you up, like when you know history, how it comes into your language of activism and performance of, of politics too, has to be an individual. Um, past. But Afsane's book was just translated for the first time into Persian. So I think the whole book. I think the whole book. I don't know. I mean, I would be surprised if it was the whole. But um, yeah, so she has, I mean, this is something that she published at least 15 years ago and has re resisted its translation into Persian. And now she has. Um, so that would be one place, right, where then activists would read and discuss and then think together about what this means, right? And of course, there's so many different layers, right? There is a whole layers of international politics that makes us focus on the veil, right? And the things that veiled women are sort of backward and, um, and yeah, and oppressed, right? And so then we ourselves internalize that, um, that discourse, and there's good reason, right? Women in Iran are under a particular kind of pressure, but to understand, like, why is it that with this, with the constitutional, uh, with the Islamic Republic of Iran, that men could shave their hair, uh, shave their face, shave, you know, wear a mustache or a beard, and in the same context, women then had to. To bring that kind of, which is already still closer to the memory, I think, of um, Iranians, would be helpful just as far as awareness is concerned. The um, Persian um, trans or, or subtitles of her talk and just publish it. And yeah, but, you know, I also want to go to yeah. Iran and, and yeah. do research. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my question is, um, 
kind of related to the previous question before Marianne. Um, and also it's related not just to their language and using the words like your, which somehow are agender in a sense. Um, and you were showing these um, pictures in which people were, uh, the gender expression was similar, both in male and female. Uh, my question is, how much do you really, and you kind of specifically insisted on that, how, how much of it is really, <coughs> sorry, how much of it is really uh, focusing on a kind of an understanding of gender, or how much of it is uh, more political? Did we really have an understanding of gender at the time? Mm -hmm. or so, it exist? a gender historian um, will tell you that gender and politics are so related to one another because gender is about social differentiation, right? One form of social differentiation that actually is very critical because every subject has to be um, engendered in some way, male, female, amrad, eunuch, right? So, I'm at the wall, right? I mean, this is the variety that you had in the pre-modern period that now is just Zan and Matt, right? Um, gender is always political because it is about how society is, how power is defined and symbolized, beginning with the household, beginning with citizens who have to be separated into male and female citizens. Marriage is a political act, right? Why is it that in order to get married, we have to go and get, you know, a permission from uh, the city of Ann Arbor, right? And we have to go to um, you know, at least a civil, some, some of us are religious, right? So these are very much ways in which power controls the, its, its citizenry. So I would say gender and sexuality is always about power. Uh, if you did have that understanding, um, how did it not have representation in household and society? How was it just in gender expression? Um, how did they see that? And, um, so can I um, ask you what you mean that how it didn't have representation um, in household? Because, for example, um, in terms of gender expression, we clearly see that it existed. So we see that the uh, female and male uh, they're, uh, have similar uh, gender expression, facial makeup. It should have had so other. So beauty is on gender. Right? Okay. Um, and then you have a series of so you have ideals of beauty, and we live in a complicated society. You have a law. According to Islamic law, um, even though uh, homosexuality and uh, lesbianism is prohibited. It falls under the, the description of ta'zir, right? Of punishments. So what happens is that this is the asymmetry that I was talking about. So so long as an older man um, actually has sex with a younger man, it's okay. So if they're the same age, you get more lashes and you get you know, a fine. If it's with a prostitute, male or female, it's also um, okay. So there are these gradations, these hierarchies by law. But we also know in the household, for instance, uh, the kinds of uh, satire and, and uh, prohibition, uh, criticism that I read to you from Paul Jari let's say, is clearly uh, showing that the blame of men actually desiring other men outside of their matrimony is placed on women. So the household is right away um, implicated in this. You have Bibi Khatun who writes about, oh my god, this, my husband, he never comes home. He's always out there playing around with other young men. You have these more of these kinds of um, information for the more modern we get, um, until the Pahlavis where there is really somehow of a forgetting that, that goes on and the ratio that goes on. But definitely from the budget view, we have a lot of information that shows us that it, it divided high households that oftentimes women had to put up, not only with one or two or three wives, but with their husbands also going out and having affairs with young men. So it's, it begins in the household, for sure. And that's why you know, gender and gender, gendering um, uh, the household too is something 
that is political and it's social and it's part of the building blocks of a society, right? So just like friendship is a way of thinking about how people communicate, create networks, um, I think desire and love are also one way of thinking about it, right? Thank you very much uh, for the talk. Uh, I think my question kind of builds on the previous question and uh, specifically your comment on how men could freely choose if they wear a beard, how they um, wear clothes, whereas women uh, were pushed towards uh, wearing the veil. And building on your previous comment on the power and politics, I'm wondering what was the social role of women in 15th century, which seemed to be more equal to men's rights, versus the social power of women in now, which are more educated, they have they have independence, they have mm -hmm. income. What was it like in 15th century, which I imagine was nothing close to today, and although women could have that power, why the other part of it didn't change? Hmm. So I would idealize the 15th century or the 16th century for women's um, rights. Um, unfortunately, this is a history that we're just beginning to do. So most of our information comes from the court. At court, um, in the 15th century, or in the 16th century with the Safavis, for instance, you have very powerful women. Um, there's no doubt that if you think about elite households, um, that's a very different kind of a context than you know, information about what happens in the rural area, like Muhammad asked, right? Um, I don't know. I don't think we'll ever know, right? But I think that um, to think that in the uh, to take the example of the Safavi court, let's say, when the daughter of Shah Tahmoz by Khanu was powerful and she could have taken over power, one has to always dis distinguish between each social context, right? And I think even today in modern Iran, if you go to a rural area, it so much depends on also who your father is, who your brother is, right? I mean, there's so, so much specificity, right? I wouldn't say that women don't have power today in Iran. I think women have a lot of power today in Iran. I think that's a misguided, I mean, look at all of you. Um, that's really a misguided, um, yeah. yeah, education does a lot. So even though in the beginning we were, we were supposed to be educated to sort of make sure that our, our husbands desired us, um, you know, things also changed. The rev one thing that the revolution did was to make education available to many more women of many different social classes um, as well. So the kinds of questions you ask, I wish I could answer, um, but I think that we are just begun to do this kinds of studies for the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. We have little examples. We'll, we will definitely do more. Um, that's why history is important. But to, to like even compare, let's say, the 15th century with the 19th, it's a really difficult. So I've picked up for you sort of little vignettes um, that would allow us to think about some of these threads um, and to actually you know, do this kind of comparison in a more systematic manner. So just uh, about uh, your answer about yard, you know, uh, it doesn't seem to me that this narration of yard is correct, especially because yard is used mostly uh, plural, yoram, in many poems, and even, for example, in Atar, we have uh, on gulfed on yard, kazu, jash, or that. So it just like, definitely doesn't mean lover. So, uh, and like uh, this, uh, I just want to ask uh, if this is the type of the narration that you, 
you know, you were basing, especially because when you spoke of Sufism, mm -hmm. uh, this was also like uh, somehow taking it equivalent to homosexuality. While we we can accept that this was practiced, but doesn't this equivalency is an extreme reading of uh, the you know. Uh, these types of I, I was looking for that kind of a, a response. Um, <laughs> so thank you for the question. No, definitely. So obviously, uh, your has many different gradations. I didn't say that your only meant uh, erotic desire because I mentioned, let's say, that this uh, widow um, of the Urdu body refers to God as your, her husband as your, and her friend as your. What I'm actually saying, and so again we have to be careful, what is in Ator in the 11th century versus this Maxabit Bukhui in the 17th and 16th century are different cases. When um, Yar is deployed as metaphysical love, love right, in most of these Hazards, except for their origin, really are talking about a met metaphysical um, relationship. Um, but in the Maktab of Bukhui, there you have particular names of your, your like Jado, for instance, who comes out. It's very clear the kind of description that Motasham gives about what Jado has done to him, right? That's that's very clearly detailed. I don't think it's an extreme reading. I think he wants us to read it that way. He wants to tell us this is what happened. This is how distraught I am from this love. But one thing that I argued too is that of course one has to be cautious because there's a spectrum of love. This spectrum of love has been closed down to me amongst friends. The possibility of um, friendship and love, right? Um, as you know, your own Estoni has a very different kind of resonance and echo than the yar that is deployed, let's say, by Muhtasham or by Muhammad Qasim, right, himself. Now, as a historian, I think I'm a careful historian, and so what I do is to try to bring in all of these different um, um, sources. The fact that the ulama are so frightened by these kinds of relationships, right, um, the, fa the fact that you have so much polemics, the fact that, that you actually, um, this grand vizier Sultan Olamo hangs a man who has actually had a relationship with a young male, tells you that fear means something. They're fearing something. Whether something happens behind closed doors or not, there's a fear of male in particular solidarities, like that of Jalal and Muhtasham, that will break hierarchies, power hierarchies that the society is built up on. So that goes back to your question about you know, sexuality and power, right? There's a fear that all of a sudden, an upstart uh, footman uh, will completely bedazzle a man and that all of the networks of alliances that have already been shaped and created will fall apart. So, I think that one has to always, you're right, bring in different sources, but one has to historicize. So, uh, my comment about uh, this was particularly about Sufism. And for example, uh, at least from my understanding, if, for example, we accept that in, uh, uh, you know, among, uh, like in Catholic Church, you know, because of things, there is, uh, homosexual relations, for example, this doesn't mean that mm. this is about homosexuality, mm. and that's equivalence that are objected to. So we can accept that this was mm -hmm. uh, among Sufis, but we cannot take Sufism equivalent to that. So that was sure. But I opened up with the um, in Khat Sabza to precisely show you that the ideal of practice in 17th century as far as Sufism, also where, when, it changes. Sufism is not just this one homogeneous thing, but precisely to show you that there was this discipline 
and these lines. But what I argued was Nazar actually incites and invites desire itself. So it's uh, very much of part of this practice, right, of gazing. And I actually think in, in the Islamic world, Nazar is what ignites sexuality in, in, in an individual. So it's until the eye doesn't hit the body that the body doesn't become becomes a sexual object of desire. So there's something there too, which is a little bit more nuanced uh, that I'm trying to develop is that there's that practice. Of course, it's prohibited. In fact, you're supposed to not be, you're supposed to desire to really feel what it means to desire, and you're not supposed to act on it, right? That is the ideal practice. And it's about an adapt, a disciplining of your body not to allow yourself. But in that process, you desire. That's how desire is shaped. You go to the websites, I always tell my students this, it's a fantastic, um, so go to uh, uh, lesson is that you go to the, the websites of these religious right people, and there's pornography that pops up on the site. In order to prohibit, you have to know what it is that you're desiring. The two actually really work closely together. And so that's partially what I'm also um, seeing, at least in the 16th and 17th. Mostly, I'm focusing just on Esfahan in the 17th century. Um, and yeah, so that's what I see. So, but I would be more than happy to, to be challenged. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Conrad, you seem to have one. I just have any questions, any specific um, that, um, that is more of a curiosity than a clarification for what you presented, but I was really in intrigued by how much of an issue clothing is in the later examples that you brought up. The Fokoli um, uh, and the Farang Ma'abi and those, those folks, and also in the Qajar era. Um, or actually, no, I'm more in the images you're showing right on the screen right now, how clothing is sort of a very highly coded uh, device that through which you articulate certain kinds of sexual politics. Mm -hmm. um, and I was kind of curious if you run into that sort of thing in your Esfahani, in your 17th century Esfahani sources, that do you see clothing sort of described in particular detail, showing, mm -hmm. and have you been able to extract ideas about what certain kinds of clothing deployed in certain ways could mean that might be different yeah. than what we might expect? So I think that there's something there that has older traces with this um, so there's a whole series that actually Mahabat Qasim and Reza Abbas, he also Moine Musafar draw of the Kolo Farangi. Um, and so, the, so the, the Western hat becomes you know, a popular um, item of clothing that really others, right? Um, and so most of the scene, and we have actually one great one of the DIA itself, um, so the, the young Amrad is wearing a kolofarangi, yeah. and so that becomes uh, a Western hat. So that becomes the semiotics of sort of othering that allows for very similarly like Bachitarso, um, like the Zonur, right, that you have in, in medieval um, poetry that you actually can desire more easily a male from another religious confession, right? And so I think that, that that's, yeah, definitely, so a dog and a hat um, comes together. Okay, well thank you so much for coming on our Friday night. Thank you.